Well, this lovely lady sitting next to me, uh, several distances, distances away in another part of LA, is my pal Maria Quaban. We worked together at Fox 11 News for many years, and uh, actually our, sh our time together was too short. It was. But uh, she has written a book about her life, and her life has taken some dramatic turns since we last spent time together. Mm -hmm. And she's written a book called You Can't Do It Alone, A Widow's Journey Through Loss, Grief, and Life After. And it is really uh, uh, kind of a cathartic experience, I would expect that, uh, I would imagine, I would say, that you've lost your husband, uh, a man that you were dating when you and I worked together at Fox. I know. And I remember, I remember how much in love you were with him and how many guys were disappointed in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. So uh, good to see you. So good to see you too. A lot has happened uh, over the years since I've seen you. And yes, when I met you, I was, I was in love. We had our fairy tale story and, and, um, and then there was the tragic diagnosis that came out of nowhere. So, yeah, yeah. I, re I remember. Uh, so my memories, forgive me for getting personal. Our offices were right next to each other. So we saw each other every day. We did. And I saw the, a very prominent picture of Sean on your desk after you two had really become very, very close and, and very serious. And you just beamed it at the sheer mention of his name. <laughs> and I, I, I've never seen so, somebody so much in love, but you really were deeply in love with him and, and every day more so. You know, I was just so grateful for, for the love that I found. A little bit later, I was older, I was divorced, mm -hmm. and I was a single mom. I had a 16-year-old son, and I didn't need to get married again. I, I, I was really happy and comfortable uh, with my career, and I was looking forward to this future with really not having to worry about anyone else. My son was growing up. So when I met Sean, it was such a surprise to meet someone who was really going to be my partner for the rest of my life. I'm like, I met this guy who really was just a, a great fit for me and my life and my family. And so we got married. We even had a baby. Yeah. It was such a surprise because by that time I was 40 something and we just didn't think we could get pregnant or I could get pregnant. And we did. So life just got better and better and better. And we were really living this happily ever, ever after life until one day we uh, went to Paris on a vacation that we had been planning. We were with a three-year-old son at the time and we had never been to Paris. We hadn't been on vacation since he was born really. And so we went on this trip and we had been working a lot. Uh, leading up to that trip. So we didn't spend, like many couples, you know, two income families. And so when we were on this trip, we just, I discovered some very odd behavior. And he was not just being forgetful, but it was just really disturbing. He was a guy that lived in New York for a long time and he couldn't hail a cab. He didn't, he was a writer by trade and he didn't get up and write in the morning. He just wanted to sleep in. He was very athletic. So it was all this behavior. And so I made him promise to see a doctor when he got home. And even he knew something was wrong. Yeah. And so it was two weeks exactly after we got back and he went to see a doctor after doctor and, and then got the diagnosis that he had glioblastoma, which some of you may know is, a, is an incurable and terminal brain cancer. Well, I, I, I don't know many people who are as positive or as direct or as strong as you are. And, uh, and I mean that I, I, before any of this ever happened, I felt that power in you. Uh, you have a tremendous capacity to love. And, and so when this happened, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What was going to be next? And you all of a sudden go from being a wife and a mother to a caretaker. Tell me about that feeling. Well, when we first um, heard the news, I was angry. I was really mad at the world. I was mad at God. I, I shouted every swear word I knew in my mind. And um, I went through a period of, of real anger at the world and, and why this man whom uh, he was a religious, he was a, a faithful person. That was one of the reasons why I fell in love with him because mm -hmm. he really was a better Catholic than I was, a better Christian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we ask those questions of why, why us? We're good people. We try to do good, you know? And um, Sean being the way he was, 
just accepted it and said, you know, this is what we got. We, we, we don't have time to be angry. We need to fix it. And so um, I really took the lead from him and he had everything to live for and he had Gus and me, our families. And so we just were on a mission to get him the best care possible. You know, so let me, let me stop you there. So indeed he did get the best care possible. You took care of him and every day was a precious day. Now what I, what, what I understand from reading your book is that you made every single day count. Tell me about that process and how you ha made that happen because I think that's such a valuable lesson. Yeah. First of all, I never thought I could get there, but but I did. There, there was just one day where it did happen. And part of that was Sean and I, first of all, we had great um, family counseling, which really I recommend for everyone. And she helped us communicate, not just with each other with this crazy diagnosis, but with- Lauren Schneider, right? She was your counselor? Uh, Lauren Schneider actually was, is a contributing writer to our book. The book, yeah amazing. We have our own uh, family therapist that uh, still work with us today, me and Gus, oh, okay. but she really helped us. And uh, there was a team of doctors. And I have to say that one day um, we, we realized it when we got home from this one doctor who really kind of spoke plainly to us. And he said, you guys have a gift. And as, as awful as this diagnosis is, you guys have been given a gift of a timeline. And so I want you to look at each day that you are here as, as a month and each month that you're here as a year. Mm -hmm. And so we really thought about that and we went home and every day at the end of the day, we would take stock of what we did, what we were grateful for. And you know what? we found a lot of things that we were grateful for and that made us so full and so happy and gave us joy. Well, yeah, to me, um, that is remarkable because how many times we just get up day to day and the day, don't even think about what we did. There's no stock, there's no inventory, there's no, uh, mo many people don't stop to meditate or prayer, or whatever, take just to understand what you've just gone through that day, right? Mm -hmm. And as you say, you multiplied each day and made it very valuable. So now as you think about that, those become pocket memories somehow that you, you, you hold on to, right? They are. Um, we, we talk about little treasures, the treasures. Yeah. Uh, but, but with my son, Gus, who's now nine years old, um, we, we, we talk about daddy all the time and we talk about those daddy memories. And thankfully with technology, we were able to videotape or, or record a lot of that stuff that we did. Oh, wow. And so we have this treasure trove of, of images and, and sound from his father that we will carry with us forever. So he's, he's not only with us in spirit, which I'm a firm believer and, and I see the evidence of it. And I tell Gus all the time that if we really look hard enough, if we really listen hard enough, we hear him and we see the messages that he sends us. You mentioned Gus and I want to talk quickly about Gus and that is, and I hate because we just the constraints of time, but Talking to your children honestly about something like this cannot be an easy thing. Tell me what your process was and how you, you were instructed to, and with things that you may have learned about how you talk to a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old and now a nine-year-old. Yeah, I couldn't have done it without our therapist. Um, our counselor was, was so integral in that, in finding the language to not just for us to talk to each other, me and Sean, but also to talk to a three-year-old at the time to discuss a cancer diagnosis. And so we were very honest with him. And I think that's the key with children. First of all, if they're old enough to ask what's wrong, they're old enough to know the answer. Yeah. And, and, and so we, we gave him the answers, of course, that was age appropriate, but we made sure to tell him that daddy was diagnosed with cancer and that he wasn't sick. We didn't use words like sick. So we told him that he had cancer and that mommy didn't have cancer and that he didn't have cancer and that the doctors were working really hard to try to fix daddy and, and try to make him better. Those two things, sick, and there's one other thing that you mentioned in your book, and that is he's gone away to a better place or something like something mystical. Kids can't quite wrap their heads around that. And I didn't realize it till I read that in your book. So sick, like if you get a cold, you're going to die. No. And so I, I think it, I think it's an interesting choice of words and, and choice of being honest and direct and not trying to create fairy tales around that problem. Yeah, it's really important. And I think that's, 
um, the kind of book that we uh, got together, me and Lauren Schneider, and we wanted to write a book that was really uh, going to be helpful for, for parents and family. Because honestly, if we didn't have the guidance that we had, I may have said some of the things that could have damaged Gus um, in the future. And so when we started talking about death and, and Sean, you know, really deteriorating, um, we use things like, you know, what happens when people die, um, people's hearts stop beating. And when people's hearts stop beating, you, they, they stop breathing. And when you stop breathing, your, your body dies. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the kinds of things that children understand. And, and, we, and that's about being honest with them about what happens when people are born and when people die. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, he understood that at a very early age. Well, he's very lucky to have you. Uh, you're a special lady. And, and let me just say this, that I, I mentioned catharsis at the beginning of this. Was this a catharsis for you to write this book? It, it was, definitely. It's been um, over two years, almost three years of, of putting this book together. And there were a lot of tears. But I, I feel as though I have fulfilled my promise to Sean and to myself. But also, I hope that the book can heal um, my heart because I feel like if this book can help other people through this dark journey, then um, that will help me heal my heart. Maria Kuman Weitzel, uh, so much appreciate, love you so much and appreciate the time that you're spending with us. And writing this book is a very special book and people should pick it up. It, uh, comes. I already pre-ordered it on Amazon, so it's coming. Uh, be sure to give it a read. It's really, you understand your heart, understand your mission, and, and I hope people will take it to heart and learn a lot about life not just death. Maria, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.